Hi, I'm Pratibha, and welcome to my talk on Python memory problems and how garbage collection happens in CPython. I have tried my best to simplify it as much as possible. So let's get started. I hope it is helpful in understanding how, in general, um, the object get allocated and deallocated. Now, memory problems are the worst nightmare of every developer whose code is serving large files or who is having a lot of computation in the production environment. If you ever face the issue of memory leak in application or out of memory exception, and you are using Python and you are banging head that everything is working as it's supposed to be, um, but you are still not able to figure out what is happening. So maybe this talk help you in understanding how the underlying architecture of garbage collection works. So this talk is aimed to summarize how garbage collection, that is freeing up the memory works in CPython. And because it is overwhelming to see the memory issues, let's get started because there are many scary issues and it's, it's difficult to fix them because they have dependencies. So let's get started. In recent years, we have seen many improvement in Python garbage collection, but there are still some instances when we are not getting back the memory that we are freeing it, or we are not getting the memory back as we uh, freeing up the large uh, variables. So this results in memory crunch for the applications, which finally crashes. Although there are multiple ways to come overcome the memory challenges, sometimes it is difficult to find what we can improve in our code and infrastructure that can make them memory efficient. In such cases, it helps to have an understanding of what is going on behind the curtain at the low level where memory is being managed. So this presentation aims to give you a quick overview of We'll discuss some common memory errors that we see in our day-to-day -day lives and how the C pattern manages garbage collection in general. So let's list down some of the memory issues we usually see in our day-to-day -day environment. And sometimes we have large objects. We Let's say we created a very big list, very big dictionary. Uh, for any computation, maybe we are parsing a large log file, but even when we are out of that function, it is still lingering in the memory, and that memory is not being released. And this is hanging around for no apparent reason. Now, there can be other reasons, like reference filing in your code. Assigning references does, don't create distinct duplicate objects, but if an object is no longer used and cannot be uh, you know, marked for garbage collection because it is being uh, referenced in other place within the application, it results in memory leak. In fact, these kinds of referencing style are one of the main problems of memory leak in the application code. Now, now this one was something which I, um, which I faced very recently in last few months, which is called unexpected memory error, and there was no solution. There was no uh, answer to why it happened. So even if you have enough RAM, you can get this unexpected memory error. After a lot of looking around, after a lot of going through the articles, I realized that the Python that was installed in my system, it was 32 bit, and it has used up all the virtual address space that is available to it. And because 32 bit applications are limited to maybe two or four GB of user mode address space, that was leading to this kind of issue. But the biggest one that we usually face is out of memory. Now, this one is something which we can regenerate on our own using uh, assigning large memory chunks to the big files or uh, big objects. Or this is something which just come just surface because we don't know what is happening. Maybe there's a memory leak. So. Usually when this happens, what is happening is when an attempt to allocate a block of memory fails, most system returns this out of memory error. It's a generic one. But the core cause of the problem 
really has to do with the actual out of memory. Maybe your actual memory space is not full. That's because the memory manager on almost every modern operating system uh, use uh, the hardest space for storing memory pages that doesn't fit if you have to just call swapping. So in addition to that, the computer can usually allocate memory until the disk is filled up. And this results in that an out of memory error. That means your swapping space is also filled, your memory is also filled. So there is a chance that your memory is not actually filled, but the space, which is for swapping and everything, that is filled. And your swapping limit has reached. But what if everything is in place and working as expected? Can there be another reason for these errors? This was the main thought in my mind when I was preparing for this talk, that what can be the reasons? And that leads me asking the question, how actually memory is being um, allocated and deallocated inside the C Python? So, Let's have a look at the memory allocation and deallocation. That is garbage collection of Python. And I hope that helps us in answering our question. So the most common explanation of the memory is thinking a computer's memory as an empty book. This is the most common explanation that we get when we try to explain it to some of the people who don't know what it is. And it is intended for short stories, which are the short applications. Now, there's nothing written on pages yet. Different authors come along, which are processors, and each author wants some space to write these stories in. Since they're not allowed to overwrite each other, they must be careful about which pages they write in. Before they begin writing, they consult the manager of the book. The manager then decides where, the, where in the book they are allowed to write. This is the standard explanation of how the memory allocation works in general in the computer memory. So, in fact, in, in correct term, computer memory is, a, it's common to call it fixed length contiguous blocks of memory pages. So this analogy holds pretty well for both of them. And authors are like different application or processes that need to store data in memory. The manager who decides where the author can write in the book and plays the role of memory manager of sorts, and the person who removes the old story to make the room for new one is garbage collector. Let's have a quick look into C Python's memory structures. In general, there are layer of there is a layer of abstraction from physical hardware to the C Python usable hardware. The operating system abstracts the physical memory and creates a virtual memory layer that applications, including Python, can access. So this whole block that you see, it can be considered as the virtual memory layer top of the actual physical memory. An OS-specific virtual memory manager, it's a very long name, let's call it just virtual memory manager, carves out a chunk of memory for Python process. So whenever there's a new process, it goes to the uh, memory manager saying that, hey, I have this process, I want to run, I want some space. So what it do, it look into its continuous memory space and say that, okay, this particular set of memories for you. The dark gray box in the image below are owned by Python processes. And CPython has an object allocator that is responsible for allocating memory within the object memory area, which is the blue box here. This object allocator is where most of the memory happens. Here, if you see, there are two parts. One is object-specific memory, where your actually objects lies, and the part is non-object memory is where it takes care of the processing and all, this, uh, all the data that is required for the processing. Not the data, but yeah, uh, the stacks and other things that it needs to process it. Now, this object allocator, which is blue, is it gets called every time a new object needs some space to be allocated or an existing object is deleted. Now, the question is, how will somebody know that object, how well 
a process, a member knows that a particular object in memory has to be deleted because it is not marked anywhere. It is not, uh, how, how, should, how should it know? So that's the question we are going to answer now. So let's have a look into the garbage collection of CPython. Now let's revise the book analogy and assume that some of the stories in the book are getting old. No one is reading or referencing this mess stories anymore. If no one is reading something or even referencing in their own work, you can get rid of them to make room for new writing. That's where garbage collections come in. There are two aspects of garbage collection. One is reference counting. Another is generation garbage collection. Let's have a quick look on how does a Python object looks like in physical memory or sorry, the virtual memory. Let's say you assign X variable and it's let, let's sorry, I'm babbling. Let's assign that you have, a, let's assume that you have a variable X and you have assigned value 20 to it. So how will it, how will it looks like? You will have a memory space which will store the actual integer of 20 and it will have a label which is x and it will be pointing or referencing to that memory location. Actual uh, Python object that will be holding this uh, 20 uh, integer value will be look like this. It will have a type which will tell that it's an integer. It will have that object will have value which will hold the actual value and then it has a reference count. Now let's see what does this reference count mean in our next slides. Sorry. So the main garbage collection algorithm used by CPython is reference counting. The basic idea is that CPython counts how many different places that have best reference to an object. So if we go back to this one, the reference count here is one because we all have only one reference to it, that is x variable. If you, if you have more variables which is pointing to this one, it will get implemented. Now, such a place could be another object or a global static variable or even a local variable. So when an object's reference count becomes zero, the object is marked for garbage collection or it is deallocated. If it contains reference to other objects, the reference counts are decremented. Those other objects may be deallocated in return, so it can have cascading effect. If this decrement makes the reference count zero, then of course, and so on. The reference count field can be examined using a function called getRefCount. It is part of our sys module, which is available in Python. And notice that the value written by this function is always one more than as the function also have reference to object when it is called. So when you assign x equal to object, the reference count was one. When you call the function get reference count, it is actually referencing the variable x. So it has implemented to two. Now, when you assign a new variable, which is y, and you assign its value as x. So now you have three, um, sorry. So now you have actually the two again. Now, again, you want to check how much is the reference count to it. So now it has become three. Sorry, let me explain again. When you have x created, the reference basic count is one. Then you have incremented the reference count by using the function get reference count because it is reference index. Now you assign the variable y as, uh, as a value of x. So now both of them, x and y, are pointing to the same memorial. And it, the reference count of that particular Python object that resides in that memory alloca uh, location incremented to three. Now you deleted variable y. So when you delete a variable y, and if it is referencing to any of the uh, other object, then the value of the reference count of that 
reference variable will decrement. So when we again run the get reference count, it comes back to two from three. That's how, in general, the reference counting works. Now, there's a problem with this, um, how should I say, reference counting scheme. It is fine when you have simple way of uh, assigning a variable, declaring a variable. You have very simplest uh, script. Everything will work fine for this case, this case. But the main problem with reference counting scheme or relying completing on reference counting is that it doesn't handle um, reference cycles. Now, let's see what reference cycles are. So for an instance, consider this code. In this example, X holds a reference to itself. So even when we remove our reference to it, the variable X, the reference count never falls to zero because it still have reference to its own internal self. Therefore, it will never be cleaned just by simple reference counting. For this reason, some additional machinery is needed to clean these reference cycles between objects once they become unreachable. This is the cyclic garbage collector, usually called as just garbage collector. Even the reference count thing is also a form of garbage collection. But garbage collector is comprises of both reference counting and the actual mechanism which takes care of the objects which have reference cycle. Now, there are there is a way of thinking that um, why do why do we have reference cycles? Maybe we can avoid having reference cycles, which is fine. You can refactor your code and everything will work. But sometimes it happens that it is required. So let's have a look at that. The algorithm that Python uses to detect these reference cycles is implemented in GC module. The GC module is part of your Python core internals and available just as OS and this module is available. The garbage collector only focus on cleaning the container objects that contain the reference to one or more objects. These can be arrays, dictionaries, lists, custom class instances, classes and extension modules, etc. One can think one could think that cycles are uncommon in kinds of objects. But the truth is that many internal references needed by the interpreter create cycle everywhere. Let's have a look at some of the notable examples. So exception that contains traces that objects contains a list of frames that contain the exception itself. It's a very wide, um, it's a very widely available example of reference cycle. Now, now, module level function reference the module cherry, which is needed to resolve globals, and which in turn contain entries for module level function itself. Instances have references to their class, which itself references its module, and module contain references to everything that is inside, or maybe other modules, and this can be back to the original instances. So like this, even if we don't want reference cycle is part of our code, part of our implementation, and we have to learn how to deal with it in longer run. Now let's have a look of garbage collections additional machinery which takes care of reference cycles because by now we have understood that it is part and parcel of our package. In order to limit the time each garbage collection takes, Garbage collector in C Python uses a popular optimization which is called generational. Just for the record, this image was taken from a blog post. It is a very clear image and really loved it. And there's a credit to it in the end in part inside useful links and credits. But this this is a very clear and if I created my, my own image, it would have been this. So I have reused the existing image. Now, the main idea behind this concept of generational garbage collection is the assumption that most objects have a very short 
lifespan and can be collected shortly after their creation. This has proven to be very close to the reality for many pattern programs as many temporary objects are created and destroyed very fast. The older an object is, the less likely it is that it will become unreachable. To take advantage of this fact, all container objects are segregated into three spaces, which are called three generations. Each new object starts in the first generation, which is generation zero list. The previous algorithm is executed only over the object of a particular generation. And if an object survives a collection of its generation, it will be moved to the next generation. So whenever a new object is created, it gets into generation zero list, then garbage collection will run over it time to time. The objects which have no references will be moved to discard list and they will be discarded. The objects that have references will be moved to the generation one list. And when the garbage collection of generation one list, the generation one list will be ran, same mechanism happen and survival, uh, surviving objects will be moved to generation two list. In generation two list, you will have objects which are going to survive till the end of the pro uh, your program. So using this mechanism, it, it is easier because in generation one, garbage collection can be run uh, less often than generation zero because generation zero is supposed to carry the objects which are going to be created fast and deleted fast. Then generation when the garbage collection has, has happened less often and garbage collection in generation two happen less often compared to generation one. So this way we don't have to keep on running garbage collection on the complete list. We have segregated them into generation based on their references. But this is one of the mechanism, or this is one of the optimization that helps in limiting the time spent by uh, PASI pattern in garbage collection. Now, let's have a look uh, how we can actually look uh, this data of generation in our Python code. So, generations are collected when number of objects that contain reaches some predefined threshold, which is unique for each generation and is lower for the older number of generations. These thresholds can be examined using, in GC module, you have get threshold. If you use this, you will know how much is the threshold after which uh, garbage collection will run on a particular generation list. By default, Python have a threshold of 700 for the youngest generation and 10 for each of the two older generations. You can check the number of objects in each generation using get count. Like here, in, uh, in generation zero, you already have 596 objects, but in uh, generation one, you have two, and generation uh, two, you have one. Now, as you can see, Python creates a number of objects by default before you even start executing program. You can trigger a manual garbage collection process by using GC collect method. So here you have 595, two and one, which, which existed even just you type Python in the console and you will get that. Now you will run GC collect method and running a garbage collection process clean up a huge amount of object. Because if you run the if you run the collect and then you again run the GC count, you will get how much objects are remaining. Here there are 577 objects in the first generation and three more in the older generation, which are cleaned up. The best part here is that you can alter the thresholds of triggering the garbage collection here. This is something where you cannot change how the reference counting reference counting work but you can change how frequently the garbage collection run in these generations. Now, how are you going to uh, modify the values here? There is a function in GC called set threshold. Using this, you can modify this value. In the example here, we increase each of our thresholds from their default. Increasing the threshold 
will reduce the frequency at which garbage collector runs. This will less computing. This will be less computationally expensive in the program. But the catch here is, uh, it will keep the dead objects around uh, longer in the memory. So maybe there is a possibility that some here, like I said, like we have said, the threshold that. After 15 objects, garbage collection should run on generation two. And if there are ref there are objects whose reference count has gone zero in generation two, they will still lie around unless either the threshold of 15 is reached or there are some mechanism which keeps checking that okay, there are uh, you can just delete those objects. Now, one of the catch that I have noticed in not the catch I would say. Uh, sometimes, not always, it is. it happens very rare that people turn off the garbage collector altogether and manually manage it. That is also feasible, but it is advisable not to do that. With this, we conclude our talk. I hope it is helpful to you. Garbage, in, in the summary, garbage collection is implemented in Python in two ways. Reference counting and generational. When the reference count of, the, of an object reaches zero, reference counting garbage collection algorithm cleans up the object immediately. If, if it has cycle, reference count doesn't reach zero. You wait for generational garbage collection algorithm to kick in and clean the object. While as a programmer, you don't have to think about garbage collection in Python, it can be useful to understand what happens under the hood because Maybe maybe you need some manual garbage collection to be run in your program. So with this, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Hello. For, thank you very much for your <laughs> talk. Uh, we can still take a few questions if somebody has one. So let's have a look if somebody is going up and. Uh, Yes, making the way to the microphone. So please ask your question. Well, many, th many thanks for your talk. Uh, I finally understood what is generational garbage collection. <laughs> I, I, never, I never exactly understood it. I have one question. Uh, we, we use Python in control systems, and we tend to run Python processes for very long times, months, and sometimes even a year or two. And we have observed that whenever uh, we have a high peak of CPU usage in the machine where it is running, it's like, the like if the garbage collector stops working. And we saw that we have a huge increase of memory, and then it, it never cleans up. Do you have an explanation for that? So this is my assumption, because based on what the data you have provided, you, whenever you have spike in CPU, you notice that the garbage collection doesn't kick in. Am I right? Doesn't? Excuse me, the, what you said, the garbage collector doesn't? Uh, I said that uh, whenever there is a spike in CPU, that means CPU is getting overloaded, garbage collection doesn't hap don't happen, and the memory doesn't get free. Exactly, yeah. Exactly, right? Because, so here's the thing, when you run a garbage collection, you have this memory to be freed up and it needs its own CPU cycles. Mm -hmm. If you already have CPU cycles which are using used for computation somewhere else, then of course it, need, it, has, it will get queued up in operating system that, hey, wait, we have this computation already uh, overloading the CPU and you have to wait for that. So that's one of the possible reasons for it. So, but yeah, that, that's what I assume happening here. Okay. okay. And as long as the CPU cycles are available, the operating systems say that, hey, garbage collection, let's go and clean up your you know, garbage so that a memory get free. But yeah, it can be a cyclic uh, you know, deadlock. CPU is not free. The computation is blocking it. Garbage collection is not able to clean up that is piling up the memory and piling up the memory the computation is not able to finish and cpu is getting spiked up 
So in that case, you have to figure out there must be some kind of memory leak or you have to restrict um, how you are, uh, how the CPU utilization is uh, spiking up because in production environment, we say that if your CPU utilization is more than 70%, that means you have to span a new instance so that the traffic get evenly distributed or the load get evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. That's Thanks. all we have time for today. Uh, so let's have another round of applause for Patriba. Thank you. And